I would like to invite here um, Gustavo Franco. Gustavo Franco is a former uh, governor of Brazilian Central Bank. He has run the Central Bank at a, one of the most challenging times there. Inflation, hyperinflation, 80% a year, a month. Uh, and uh, every time I say this, especially to Brazilians, it's funny because uh, we have created the first ever digital currency of the world. It was called URV. And Gustavo was the one implementing that uh, by that time. I'm going to bring you your little thing here to help you with that. And uh, thank you for coming, Gustavo. Make it all the way. Well, uh, good morning. It's working. Um, I would like to start with a few disclaimers. First one about casting. Um, central banker to talk about the future is a bit of a contradiction. We're like conservative animals and pessimistic in general, always looking at what can go wrong. And uh, in money, everything can go wrong. So that's our job to be pessimistic. Um, so apologies for that. I will avoid that, but to the extent of my expertise, I'm not sure how, how much. Um, I have a written notes available to all, not a PowerPoint. That's another shortcoming for me. Previous presentations have been... Um, I, I have no ability to do that, so I have to do it with my own, my own voice. I hope it works, right? And then they give me that huge topic, uh, which is in, unmanageable for the last presentation before lunch, right? <laughs> That's just cruelty, right? It's okay. Um, I'll be very selective. Uh, in the spirit of the meeting, I'll throw one grenade uh, and to make you think. Um, and that's my job, right? The, um, I have three assumptions, a few assumptions about what I'm going to say. The first is very controversial. It says, well, um, uh, the, as far as money is concerned, the past tells you a lot about the future. Uh, it's a pretty uncomfortable, many people think that the things happening now in terms of money and financial innovation are unheard, uh, unknown, not, though, not so much. In the history of money, we have had the same issues over and over again. And especially when fiduciary money was invented, it's what called fiat money, pieces of paper, um, we kind of broke a barrier uh, Leaving money uh, ceased to be a commodity thing with value intrinsic to it to become a representation. It is just like modern art, right? You started something to bring subjective considerations into representations of value, and then, you know, there's no more control, no more limit, better said, about um, what money could be, how values can be defined, and the job of the central bank becomes um, much more difficult, right? That's, and a, 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 a third consideration is that um, innovation comes uh, by conventional channels in universities, R&D centers, and in countries in which governments invest into technology and research. But it also comes, the demand side of it, is the urgency of extreme situations. My country is one case in which the extremities are like mothers of invention. We've innovated a lot in terms of payments, agility, all that that Roberto has explained in his, what well, has to do with the fact that we live through hyperinflation and that makes you kind of quick on your money decisions or else you don't survive. Um, so with these three, three considerations, uh, 
made. Uh, the one classic classroom question is that, well, now that you have said that everything that we are living have been seen before, please be specific on exactly how and where we have seen data ownership discussion in the past, right? That's the aha question that I pretend to answer in the remaining five minutes that I have, and I hope to leave you something to think about. Um, the one situation that I think is pretty much like the one we are living now with data ownership um, discussions is something in one sentence called fractional reserve banking debate. Pretty technical language and old. This is 30s. Uh, Irving Fisher's wording on, on that. And that has to do with the fact that, well, banks create money and banks retain just a fraction of your money when you give them your money to, for them in deposits. They keep just a fraction. If you go there, see your money, it's not there. We have seen that uh, a lot of times in history. They lend your money uh, without you knowing what's happening. And that, you know, that's produced problems in the past in a number of ways. So it's like a uh, history of bank runs and bank crises uh, runs as far back as we invented money. And the first banks started to operate, they discovered that not everybody comes to the bank at the same time to see their money. So they put that money to, to work to their favor, not to the owners of the resources necessarily, okay? So through time, uh, uh, especially in times of crisis, there's been uh, anger about well, banks going under and losing people's money, uh, and that created a debate on perhaps we should forbid banks from leveraging that's the modern term for, for fractional reserve banking. Uh, or else they will commit abuses and um, lose your money, have problems. Uh, so in the 30s, there was something, a revolt of sorts against that, or people proposing new um, ideas to deal with the problem. And the, one of the most famous ideas was known as the Chicago Plan. Uh, modern term for the Chicago Plan is narrow banking. Or in the 40s, it was like 100% reserves banking. That is, your money should be there 100%, 100% of the time, not sometimes, not only when you go see, right? So no fractional, 100%. That was the idea. Pretty radical, right? Uh, never actually been put into practice because it would mean like the destruction of banking and banking and capital markets have a utility for society, right? So we don't do, want to destroy that. But uh, then, but the tension was there. The people were not comfortable with the situation. And, well, um, regulation followed a sort of compromising way of finding formulas for um, inserting prudency, transparency, and all that, accountability into banks. That's called prudential regulation, right? Through time, uh, well, better than uh, Finnish banks, try to put some discipline into their behavior, not to go bankrupt every 20 years and, and all that. Uh, and one of the major um, innovations in that regard was born in the Swiss city of Basel, uh, where the Bank of International Settlements is based. It was a Multilateral, multilateral bank created in, in the 20s, having to do with circumstances that were no longer relevant. But that bureaucracy was there and has become like the bank supervision hub 
of the world. Uh, like the World Bank and the IMF, the BIS is crucial for that thing called banking supervision that has to do with establishing capital requirements for bank proportional to the risks they take in order to avoid banks to take too many risks and lose people, other people's money and all that. And BIS uh, created a succession of rules. They're not um, sovereign enough to impose rules on anybody to just, you know, do what they call the accords, uh, uh, Basel Accords 1, 2, and 3 made last 30 years, uh, sort of um, put up um, rules for prudence, prudence in how sound banking systems should work, and each country should apply the way, you know, it found relevant and useful for that countries uh, going through the legislative regulatory process, whatever. But the fact is that the leadership in prudential regulation emanating from the BIS has been crucial to tone down all the tensions related to fractional reserve banking, right? The same tension that we have uh, with regards to data. So maybe that... Um, sort of template is relevant for what we are discussing today. When you um, go to a bank and make a deposit, in certain ways, your ownership of that resource becomes a little restricted, confusing. Uh, not that the money ceases to be yours, but if that bank goes under, uh, where's your money? What happens, right? you are then a creditor, like every other creditor of a bank that may not have all the assets to pay you. So you may have to go to a queue with other creditors, right? So let's prevent this from happening. So the ownership thing is there, is very important, right? Uh, that's how far we can go with the analogy, right? Uh, a regulator body that sort of controls the extent to which banks can use your money to do their balance sheet leverage uh, is, is very crucial, right? Uh, the bank lends your money to somebody else. You have nothing to do with that. They earn interest out of that money. Uh, they don't pay you. Right, because assets are separated from liabilities in the world of banking. Uh, it's working just like that in the field of data, right? Uh, banks sometimes pay for deposits, sometimes not, mostly not. Demand deposits are free most in most countries. Time deposits are remunerated. Uh, in data, well, some data is given for free or in exchange for services in a contract. Other types of data are remunerated as you upload videos in YouTube or if it's music. Well, why not? Every other data that is important is paid for. Uh, mm, there should be a way to make them pay, right? That's more or less the lesson we are hearing this. Uh, how this will come up in the field of um, data. Well, I think looking at the fractional uh, reserve banking experience and prudential regulation to banks will help um, as a template. Uh, I see there are at least five rails of uh, reform ideas regarding the data ownership, all of which uh, sort of similar, in a way, uh, regulation and legislation led with the problem of fractionary reserve. First is, well, academic research treating data as labor, embodied labor, imaginary labor, intellectual labor, um, but basically labor. There's books written uh, and ideas, well, the blockbuster, book uh, of Asimogul, Daron Asimogul, Simon Johnson on called Power, Power and Progress has a chapter on that uh, and it gets ideas from earlier work from Jérôme Lanier, uh, Glenn Wheel, 
um, and they speak about data unions as a way, for instance, to create countervailing power to the um, giant tech companies, the tech oligarchs, as they've been named here, um, a union, right, to negotiate, like it was a collective bargaining thing. That's useful because through history, technological progress was appropriated more by capital or labor according to uh, negotiations like that. Why not? This could not be the case for, for data. Well, second branch was simply well, taxing the excesses of those using excessively uh, our data and taxing advertised, uh, targeted advertising is the one idea that is around, it's being applied here and there. Uh, nobody likes taxes, better to go to some other solution, but it's, it's an alternative. Third is like the French Revolution, it was mentioned uh, a while ago by, by Brett. Uh, it's, I like the term techno-feudalism because, um, well, it's, it's been used by a new blockbuster book by this fellow called Yanis Varoufakis. You may have not heard of him. He was Finster, Minister of Finance of Greece during the time of the Greek uh, crisis in the Euro. Very famous guy that drove a Harley Davidson, uh, finance minister, first one in history, I guess. But he writes books, very good books, uh, very um, provocative ones, and he wrote one just now called techno-feudalism. Uh, that same term has been used in the past by Glenn Will. Uh, it's been used earlier today by, by Brett King. I like the idea, the term in this language, when I remember, especially when I remember that feudalism has been finished by enclosures. That was establishing property rights on the commons that were not truly commons and social land. It was land of the Lord that was used collectively in ways that the sharing of the proceeds of that land were not exactly fair, right? Enclosures, establishing ownership to the land was crucial to finish that system. I like that part. Number four, it was mentioned by Roberto Campos Neto, open finance. Uh, the financial system has discovered uh, that, well, they live through a, they live in a sort of big monopoly. Um, they are like the power company that forces you to buy all your appliances from their brand. Imagine that. If you did not have the choice of appliances, of any brands of toasters and stereos, uh, and would have to buy them from your power company. That's more or less what happens in the financial system. But please don't expect banks to cooperate in finishing with that system. That's open finance. That you know, happens in many ways in many countries. It's going on, but it's going to take forever to, uh, to happen truly, depending, of course, on the jurisdiction and the speed of uh, regulators and the demands from people. It's a fascinating program, but it's, it's hard. Well, and fifth, number five, is exactly what we are discussing here, uh, a sort of market-based or voluntary-based system through which there's a business model that um, allows people, that we have the technology to, to do that, allows people to claim ownership on the data they produce, and, and then there's intermediaries, brokers, agents, call it whatever you wish, but uh, somebody goes there doing the bargaining on your, on your behalf. Uh, that's, you know, 
perfect. You know, these five uh, channels of the same, of relieving that same tension are not inconsistent. Probably the future will be like a mixing of all that. All that's going to happen at the same time. The future tends to be something very confusing. I don't know exactly. I, I, I'm sure that regulators like uh, what we are discussing here. It's, something will happen. Hard to predict exactly uh, what exactly will be the, the outcome. Um, it will be better, for sure, for every one of us, I guess. Uh, that's my grenade. And uh, uh, I'm not using all my time, I guess, but that's, that's my grenade. It's simple enough. There's many ways to do that. It has to do with something we've seen before in the financial system, yes. Uh, the ownership of, ownership of money, the ownership of data, more or less the same. Um, and, and thank you very much. Thank you.